this is not investment advice, but a lot of people are super impatient in the NFT space, like insanely impatient. I thought the crypto industry was impatient because they wanted gains like returns super quickly. The NFT space is like one day impatient, hours impatient, meaning like people will buy something and if it doesn't like increase in value in the next six hours, they'll sell it at a loss. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life. This is the podcast where you can hear the life stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Before we get into today's conversation with Ish, there's a couple things that I want to go over with you first. If you enjoy today's podcast, be sure to leave us a positive rating interview, share this episode with a friend, and subscribe to the show. Put a brand new interviews every single Monday and a brand new takeaways episode as an audio exclusive where I sit down and break down the most recent podcast episode of the week every single Thursday. And now, today on the podcast, we are joined by Ishmael Dardusco El Tercero. Ish is the director, growth, and marketing for Crave, and he's a best-selling author. Prior to that, he spent time at both LinkedIn and Snapchat and toured the U.S. as a DJ, and I cannot be more excited to have him here on the podcast today. Ish, welcome to the show. Very cool, Jacob. That was probably one of the best intros I've ever heard, and I've done a lot of these podcast interviews. So I'm super glad to be here, and I'm excited to see um, what you have for me. Thank you, man. I'm excited to have you here. So where I want to start, where I like to start every podcast, I like to go back to the beginning. So talking about growing up, from my understanding, you grew up in LA, right? Yeah, yeah. I spent uh, probably like my first ten years in LA, like, uh, and and then like high school in in, in an Empire, which is like thirty, forty miles east of LA. Um, so yeah, I was born in, uh, I was actually born in Culver city before Culver city was like the cool and hip thing to do. Um, uh, I grew up in like East LA, which is a predominantly like Latino Hispanic uh, community, uh, South LA, uh, South gay. I, I lived in a lot of different places. I think I moved like 10 or 11 times, um, by the time I hit high school, maybe even before that actually like middle school. So we moved a lot growing up. Um, my parents had me pretty young too. So my mom had me at 19 years old. Um, and so, I mean, we, we didn't like live super lavishly growing up. We, we had, you know, the basic needs and necessities. Um, but I guess it, it wasn't until like now that I work in tech or even a few years ago when I got into tech that I realized that like my upbringing was extremely different from a lot of other people um, who come from like wealthier backgrounds. Um, but yeah, like I, I remember I interviewed my mom one time and I asked her a question like, could you explain like what was it like growing like having a kid at 19 20 years old and like what were some of the hard times like and she said uh she said like well like some of the some of the luxuries that we had during your like early years were like you know having air conditioner and uh being able to go to McDonald's like you know once every other week or something like that and like that was a luxury and then when when you contrast that with you know some of the people that that maybe you know, had that on a regular basis or even think twice about that. It's just completely different, like mindsets. A hundred percent. And so I'm curious, like to get your perspective on, on that. So I was listening to a lot of Tom Bilyeu interviews a, a couple months ago, and he was talking about when they started Quest, like they started hiring a lot of people from, from low income neighborhoods. Like he said, they were in Compton, they were hiring people from Compton. And he said, there's people there that are just ridiculously talented and smart, but because of where they grow up and kind of just their zip code, it really impacts them for the rest of their life. Uh, like even just from a mindset perspective, they don't realize what's possible until they, until they get out of that situation. So what's kind of your advice to people to, to in that situation, how do they kind of push beyond it and see what's out there? Uh, I mean, we're lucky enough to have like the internet, right? I mean, 20 years ago, it wasn't as accessible to learn from people like you and I and Tom Bill, you and Gary B and, you know, Tim Ferriss and Oprah Winfrey and all that. So I think like, purposely putting yourself in positions where you're actively learning from these people will give you like different exposures to different areas of life and different areas of the world. Um, and then from there, you'll start to like, you know, open your eyes and start to realize like, oh, snap, like I actually have an interest in this, but I never thought of it because, you know, the 20 people around me on a weekly basis are in a certain mindset, you know, so um, just giving it more exposure and purposely like putting yourself in a position to like, consume that information on a daily or weekly basis because i think most people when you ask them a question of like like do you learn regularly people will say yeah of course i learn but then when you ask them like what specifically have you learned can you show me like a book a podcast or a blog article that you learned recently and then everybody like kind of says like oh like 
I don't have one, but like three months ago, I read this one book and it was super good. So like purposely putting yourself in a position where you say like this month, I'm going to read one book. Next month, I'm going to try to read two books. Or like this week, the goal is to listen to two new podcasts. And then if I like one of them, then I'm going to listen to another podcast episode from that person. Um, and then kind of like you go expanding like your mind um, with different perspectives from different people. And is there a way like you try to, I mean, you laid it out like to just kind of start small and build on top of it, but is there a way when you're doing kind of online education and self-teaching, is there a way you like to structure it? Cause I feel like that's kind of a hurdle or a barrier I've had trouble with in the past. It's like, I want to learn about something, but because the, it's all there on the internet, but it's so vast, it's in so many different places that I struggle figuring out how to learn things in a structured way, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm sure I'm skipping a lot right now, but that's the first chapter in my book. So it's the first step in my book. Um, there's, I wrote, I wrote a self-development book aimed at helping people from underrepresented communities achieve their goals. And the reason why I did that is because I took a look at, I had read like hundreds of self-development books and I looked at all the authors and they were, none of them were people that looked like me or were like, you know, came from communities that I come from. Um, and so I decided to write a book, study a lot of people and write a book that would help others. The first chapter in the book uh, deconstructs what a lot of psychologists call your self-concept. Um, and the, re the way that I got to this is I analyzed like hundreds of different uh, successful people. And I realized that they were all really good at this one thing. And I couldn't figure out like what it was and how to teach somebody else what that one thing was. It ended up being um, self-awareness. Like you, these people are so like, good at what they do because they're so self-aware. They know exactly what they're doing. They're intentional with their actions. They're intentional with their time and their energy. But you can't teach somebody through a book or through a podcast how to be self-aware. You can tell them like, yo, you gotta be really self-aware. You gotta think about yourself. You gotta think about your actions. But like me telling you that doesn't actually tell you what you gotta do to be self-aware, right? It's just like this conceptual thing that you like, everybody talks about, but nobody can teach you how to do. And so in the first chapter, I walk through an entire exercise and it's like questions that you need to ask yourself. Um, and you're basically treating yourself as a, a science experiment. And, you know, if you think back into like high school biology class, what in the science experiment, you had like a hypothesis, you had a thesis and you had a bunch of questions, you know, what does the frog look like? What does the frog, uh, what does the frog do when you hit it with this or put this on it? Um, bad example. But if you think about yourself in that situation, right? Like, the questions that I had, some of them are like, uh, what is Ish, when is Ish uh, most creative? What time of day? What gives Ish energy? What is Ish love doing? What does Ish hate doing? If Ish didn't have to do one more thing for the rest of his life, what would it be? And then deconstructing different areas of your life as well. If you look at work, what parts of work do you love doing? What parts of work do you hate doing? Where does your energy flow? How can you start structuring those different areas of your day so that they flow a lot better? And then you look at your love life, your relationships, your family. And then at the end of that exper uh, exercise, you end up understanding yourself a lot better and you become a lot more self-aware. So that when you have conversations with other people, you're able to like reference in your mind, like, oh yeah, that's me. Or like, that's me. So then when you go to the internet, which is like a huge, you know, white space, trying to figure out where do I learn from, you're able to like intentionally go out and search. I want to learn more about podcasting. Because I've learned after um, examining myself that I love asking people questions. And I love listening to people who ask great questions like Guy Raz and Oprah Winfrey. So if I'm attracted to these kinds of people, it must mean either I just love podcasting or I might be myself a great podcaster one day. And then you just work backwards. And so, and you don't necessarily need the natural ability either, right? Like you have the belief that no one's born an entrepreneur or born anything, right? Like you can teach yourself these things, right? Yeah. I think if people want to be an entrepreneur, they definitely can. Um, there are people that are raised by entrepreneurs and uh, they have the upper hand because um, from, from a really young age, they, they had that exposure to it, you know, versus others who maybe did it but they still can because they have the grit in them and they have uh, the willingness to do it. Absolutely. You mentioned Gary Vee and I like where Gary Vee says, if you can look at someone and find someone that came from a similar situation that looks like you, that has achieved what you want to achieve, then you just, you know, it's possible. It's possible for sure. Yeah. That's why I do a lot of things that I do actually. <laughs> Cause your, your mom was entrepreneurial, right? When you were growing up. Yeah. My mom is super entrepreneurial. I didn't realize it till like recent years. Uh, she had a lot of businesses growing up uh, from Tupperware from like, 
going to the swap meet and selling shoes, like buying shoes in downtown LA and big boxes and then flipping them, selling them at the swap meet. Um, now she has her own business doing like uh, lashes um, and it's been going really well. She's had it for a few years now, but she's her own boss. She, she, she I've learned a lot um, from her that I didn't know that I learned. Things just like hustling, things like, you know, building relationships, business, uh, negotiation, um, all those crucial things that every entrepreneur should have. I think I picked them up at an earlier age and I didn't realize it till now. And so then what was that moment that made you realize? Like, what was there like, were you reflecting, were you journaling or something and it just kind of like clicked or like, what was that moment when you realized, oh, I learned a lot of this from my mom? Uh, I think it was honestly when I was writing the book and I went through that first chapter because I, I used the... I use the framework in the book to write the book. Um, and I use the framework in the book to get my dream jobs at Snapchat, at LinkedIn. I use that framework in the book to go on a national DJ tour while juggling a job. I use that, like I use the framework to write, like, I mean, to start a company. Like I've used that framework for so many different things, but I actually like went through the exercises myself too. So when I was going through chapter one and I was like an a- an analyzing myself and I was like, okay, I'm extremely entrepreneurial. Why? Keep asking questions like that. Why, 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 how, when, you know, and then it started to hone in like, okay, well, my dad was really good at building relationships. My mom is just a hustler, natural born hustler. She works really hard. She grinds um, and she, you know, she gets things done. So I was like, oh, that must be how I came about. Like I got this from her, this from him. And then, you know, my interests and my goals just like carried me through my life. I think what's interesting as, as someone who's written a book, correct me if I'm wrong, but you struggled with reading and writing kind of coming into high school, right? Like I think it was one of the baseball (laughs) coaches who switched you into his class or something like that in the ninth grade into the harder, the harder. You you did your research. Yeah. So, uh, uh, his name was Mr. Mel Trucker. I still remember his name. I don't remember very many of my teacher's names. And, um, even to like a few years ago, I did, I wasn't really good at writing. Um, to this day, I don't think I'm a great writer. But I try and I, I've been trying to get better and better. And so I had a really difficult time growing up reading aloud and writing because um, I, I told you my mom had me at 19 years old. So my, both my grandmothers from both sides of my family were very influential in like raising me and helping me like, you know, from zero to six years old. They were like there all the time. And they're from Mexico. They don't speak any English, like barely any, barely any English. And so I grew up learning English and Spanish at the same time. Um, now my Spanish isn't as great as it should be. Um, but, you know, at that time, as a kid, you just absorb, like you're like a sponge. So you just take it all in. And so I learned English and Spanish at the same time. And a lot of times when I was in class in elementary school and even high school, middle school, I would say things or write things in Spanish tense. And sometimes it wouldn't make like, sense. Like it would be like past tense, but it means to be future tense or current tense. But it would make sense in my brain. And when you translate it to Spanish, it made sense. Um, and it wasn't until like a few years ago when I was thinking of writing the book, I was like, I should probably like try to get better at this, you know? Um, so I hired an editor. I had some friends coach me. Um, I had a couple of just mentors just help me out. And I just made it a, a practice. I started writing a weekly, um, a weekly blog on LinkedIn. And I just, every single week, I try to crank one out. And just like write about different things, things that I was learning, marketing, self-development, my life, uh, the book, random things. But I would get better and better and better and better and better to the point where like now I feel super comfortable writing. And like if you think back five, six years ago when I first started at LinkedIn, I would like be so scared to write an email because I was afraid that like people were going to like judge me because, you know, the grammar or something like that. So when you're publishing these, these blogs, I feel like the hardest thing for people to do is, is to hit that publish is to, you know, to share that content that they've created. And I'm assuming there, was there some self doubt or something in there as you're putting this out? Like, did you ever not want to publish a blog? So you were worried about what people would think blog, especially. So like, I've been active on social media since I can remember since I was like my space days or before that it was like AOL and some messenger. Um, so I've always been, not necessarily been a public figure, but I've always been used to having a following of people and creating content on a daily basis and just pumping it out on all different channels, like five to six different channels at once. Um, but then when it came to writing, I became extra like self-conscious about it. I was like, oh my God, the whole world is going to know I'm a fraud. 
like I am not smart. I think people think of me as this guy who's like overachieving and this and that. And like now they're going to catch me in my like tracks, you know, because I can't even write. Um, so, but what I did is uh, I started tweeting more. I looked to Twitter as like, okay, if I can figure out how to get my message across in one tweet, it was 280 characters back then it was like 140. Um, then it'll help me be like more defined with my messaging. And it'll start make me start realizing like, okay, that was grammatic, grammatically incorrect. This was grammatically incorrect. And then, you know, repetitions over time, just like a baseball player, like trying to bat little by little, you get better and better and better. A hundred percent. And now kind of with that too. So you said you've been on social media for, since you can remember, was part of that because you were a DJ and that was a way to share your music? No, it was way before that. Honestly, um, I fell in love with social media when, with AIM, AOL Instant Messenger. I think I had a Sidekick 3 at the time, the the T-Mobile Sidekick 3. And one of the reasons why I think social media was super cool at the time, I mean, AOL Instant Messenger is not even social media, but it was like the first the first thing that I had ever uh, experienced that allowed me to connect with people that I had made friendships with over time. And I shared earlier with you, like I moved a lot growing up. So like it would suck so bad to like move to a new city and you're like in third grade and you make friends. And then 12 months later, you're gone to like another city 12, 20 miles away and you make new friends, new cut on the block all over again. So like I went to like not that many schools, but I went to probably like three different elementary schools, two different middle schools and luckily one high school, but I moved to a lot of different cities. So I had like these friends that I would make with over time and I had no way of keeping track of them or like keeping in contact with them until like AOL and Sim Messenger came out, then MySpace. And then I was like, holy shit, this is so cool. All the people that I've like met, now I can like keep in contact with them. And so that was like the light bulb moment for me. And then tw- and then I got a taste of Twitter and then Snapchat stories came out and I was like, this is incredible. I just fell in love. I'm also a very creative person. So I'm a weird blend of like entrepreneurial, uh, ambivert, and then creative. So like, I like to be social sometimes, but sometimes I like to be very reserved. Um, and so I think social media is like the perfect blend of like, you can put yourself out there, but you don't necessarily have to be like your face showing all the time or speaking at, you know, events or anything like that. I think with, with TikTok now, we're seeing people being able to put video content out without showing their face, without even talking. And we're finding a lot of success that way. So I think that's, it's been really interesting to watch that happen. I mean, like people have been doing it on YouTube, but definitely to greater success on TikTok. Yeah, I agree. There was one friend in particular of yours that I wanted to ask you about. I believe I have his name correct. Was it Andrew Rios? Yeah, Andrew Rios. <laughs> and he's, so he's the one who you learned DJing from, right? Yeah, yeah, it's one of my best friends. I've seen him to this day still. I think I saw him like maybe a month ago, two months ago. Um, so he's been one of my friends since high school. We played soccer together. Um, I think he played defense and I played goalie. But yeah, I remember in soccer practice, not soccer practice, but like in high school, we would leave soccer practice. And sometimes I'll go to his house and... Uh, you know, just hang out with your soccer shorts and cleats and just like with the guys, like doing guy things. I don't know, you know, going to Jack in the Box and just hanging out and talking. And uh, he was, he was like the school DJ, one of the school DJs at the time. I don't know. We were like 15 years old and he would DJ like parties and quinceañeras and like all the events that we were all going to. And so one day I was like, you know, this is pretty cool. The fact that this one person has control over, not control, but like, this one person influences whether all these people have a good time or not, because if he does a bad job, they have a bad time. If he does a good job, they have a great time. So like that was fascinating to me. And so I just asked him one day, I was like, yo, can I, like, if I put in the work, I just come over to your house. Like can you teach me a little by little, like, I don't know crap. I don't have a laptop. I don't have anything, but like, maybe I could learn. And so little by little, I just learned, learned, learned. Then went off to college and bought my own like little mixer and just kept building building blocks you know i bought speakers started doing parties started doing concerts started doing clubs and went on a tour so yeah and at college it was just like there was two campus djs and you guys were both friends right it was you and dj swipe yeah, yeah it's my boy dj swipe i was just texting him right now um so it was just us two it was a small school though like i think we had i don't know five thousand people at uc merced at the time so everybody kind of knew each other it felt like a big high school um and so we would both be djing at you know on friday night saturday night He'd be on one side of town. I'd be on the other side of town. And when the cops would show up to my party, I would just like text him like, yo, the cops showed up. Like I'm about to send everybody over to your party and then just get on the mic or like text everybody and be like, yo, party's over that DJ swipes. Like everybody go over there. 
and just like funneling people, like hundreds of people. So much fun. And so like you said, you ended up going on tour. I believe you played Tao Las Vegas for your, was it your birthday one year? Yeah, that was my birthday. Uh, I think like three or four years, four years ago, I think. Yeah. And I think what's interesting, so you were clearly a successful DJ, but the entire time you never went like exclusively as a DJ from my understanding. Like you were always working or going to school. You never dove headfirst into it. And I'm curious why not. Um, I don't know if I would have enjoyed it, honestly. Um, be, other people talk about this a lot, but when you are all in on something like DJing, unless you're like in the top one or 2% and you're getting paid really, really good money, you're dependent on that check for your livelihood, right? And a lot of times when there's like a ton of competition, like, you know, thousands of DJs, other people are willing to do a gig for cheaper. And so being a full-time DJ would have been really risky because I would have forced me to either, you know, take gigs that I didn't want to take, which I wasn't willing to do. I only wanted to do certain types of gigs, certain types of venues. Um, and actually, that's pretty much it. Like, I, it allowed me to be selective with my journey and craft my DJ experience the way I want it to be versus if I was a full-time DJ, I would have had to take taco Tuesday gigs, wing Wednesday gigs, you know, random bar nights where I'm the opener from nine to 10 and nobody's there. And, you know, having a full-time job allowed me to say like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I'll take this one. I'll take that one because I could see like the pattern of, if I build on this one then build on that one, then I can open up for a track over here and then I can do this over here. And, you know, the promoters are going to see that as like he's building and he's growing. So they're going to want to pick me over somebody else. And I see that with creatives a lot. I see that with the creatives a lot, too, though, actually. If you think about it, like creatives who are full time with their their gig. Are in a vulnerable situation because they need that check in order to like survive. Right. So whenever I talk to creatives or entrepreneurs or, you know, entertainers or DJs or artists, I always tell them, try to find something that's going to cover the bills. So that you can do your creative stuff on the side until it becomes to a point where it's like funding your job and more or funding your life and more. But otherwise, it's going to put you in a really weird situation like multiple times. I've even talked to people who have like had that, that, that side hustle, that goal that they've been working towards. And then once they finally get to that point where it becomes the main thing and they achieve that goal, it doesn't feel the same as it was when it was a side hustle. You know what I mean? Like once it becomes the main income, like it, it just changes the whole dynamic. And like people always ask, like if I did the podcast full time, how would I feel? I'd be like, I don't, I don't know how I'd feel at that point. Cause I just, it, it just changes everything when it becomes the main thing. Yeah. I can see that for sure. Also DJing is pretty exhausting. I don't know if you've seen the Vici documentary on Netflix. Um, no, you should watch that. He did a lot of gigs. He did like 500 gigs in like two years or something like that. And I mean, I wasn't at the Vici level, but I was DJing like two or three nights a week while doing a full-time job, a demanding job. And I mean, when you're DJing, you're out from 9 p.m. until 3 a.m. I mean, that's, it's, it's exhausting, honestly. So I could only imagine people who do it full-time. Um, yeah, I, I just don't think I was going to be willing to, to put it in anymore. And so is that ultimately the reason why you stopped DJing? Uh, partially. I partially stopped because I came down to work at Snap in LA. Um, and then Shortly after that, I kind of wanted to just focus on like killing it in my, my job. Um, and then I started writing the book. So I figured there's only two big things that I could do right now. If one of them is a book and the other one's my job, everything else needs to stop. So I paused everything. I paused the podcast. I paused uh, DJing. I paused like so many outings, going out with friends. I didn't do anything. I was like a hermit for like eight to 10 months. And then I wrote the book, published it. And I was like, okay, I'm getting some of my life back now. Why did you decide to do that? Because there's obviously some sunk costs, with, especially with DJing and the podcast and everything else you had going on. You'd put the time in there, been money spent there. But so why did you decide to pause everything to focus on the book? Uh, it was going to be there when I was going to be done. Like DJing, I can pick up turntables right now and go DJ at a club this week and if I really wanted to. Um, the podcast, I could recontinue it afterwards. People kept asking for it, but you know, there's episodes there and I told them it's not a priority right now. I'm writing a book, which I think is going to be more impactful and it's more scalable. So, you know, there's only so many things you can do. Um, and I, for one, like to overload my plate with too much work. So I've, you know, looked in the mirror and I said, like, no, you can't do this. You can't do everything. So you got to pick two or three things and then prioritize those over everything else. 
And then, so the moment you decided to write that book, I believe you were in the car listening to Think and Grow Rich, right? Yeah, it's such a good book. I've re-listened to it recently too. Um, yeah, so I was I was really I was listening to that book, going down to see my sister in San Diego. Um, and funny enough, like whoever recommended that book to me told me like, this book is going to speak to you in some way or another. And like, I'm not like that type of person. So I kind of just said like, yeah, whatever, that's bullshit. Like I'm reading it because I like self-development books. And this always comes up on the list of like top 10 and I haven't read it. Um, so I'll check it out. And I do audio audible only. Um, I have really bad ADHD. So like I have a trouble reading on top of like what I told you earlier, just my childhood trauma, I guess, from reading. Um, so I only do audible and I was listening to it on my ride to San Diego. And I don't know, it was like halfway through the book and something literally spoke to me. Um, and this is after like, a couple of years of just like going ham on self-development. Like I was pumping out books like every couple of days, just reading a new book or listening to a new book, podcast daily, YouTube videos on just random self-development stuff daily. Um, and so this is like deep in my self-development journey. And one day I was listening to that, that book and um, something just said like in my head, just said like issue being like selfish for not sharing all this knowledge with other people from your community. It was like a self kind of like uh, if you can imagine, I don't know if you've had those scary dreams where you could see yourself. Uh, I think it like call like night terrors and like that. So that's kind of how it felt while driving. Like I could see myself and I was like, shit, this is right. Like I should probably do something about it. And so me being the problem solver that I am, I started thinking through during that drive. I was like, what are the different things that I can do to solve for this problem? One could be like uh, do a podcast series around things that I learned. I was like, yeah, that could be good, but like not everybody listens to podcasts. Another one was like, I could do blogs. Maybe I could do a blog on everything that I've learned and do a hundred blogs or something. And I was like, I can't even think of one blog post that has like impacted my life that much to the point where I was like, this changed my life. Everybody needs to read it. But then I started thinking about books and I was like, shit, there's like 25 books that have like deeply impacted my life and that I recommend to everybody that I meet. And I was like, I think I need to write a book. And that was like the worst, that, that was like, my last resort, you know, because I was a bad writer since I was growing up. I did not want, like, I did not want to do that. That scared me shitless. Um, but yeah, I ultimately decided I had to. So talk to me about putting that book together, but then or like day one, when you're sitting in front of a blank screen and you know that this blank screen is eventually going to become an entire book, like what's kind of going through your mind and how do you just start? It's not, it wasn't that difficult to start. I get that question a lot, but because, because I was like, so obsessed with self-development and I still am I had taken like notes in my phone on all these different books and I like even posted some of them on LinkedIn on like here's my book recap for this book and so I had these like random notes of just like basically like uh cliff notes if you remember cliff notes I don't know if you use them in high school but that's basically how I got by um it was like my cliff notes version of everything that I had learned and I had them just like everywhere like on paper and on my phone and on my laptop. And so I already had a lot of the knowledge was there. I just had to do extra deep research on specific people. And then um, subcategories for those people, for example, like minimalism was something that I noticed a lot of these people practice in their lives. So then I had to like, not only study, you know, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson or like Rob Deerdeck, it was like also like, okay, some of these people practice this, I gotta go learn about this now and become an expert in this. Um, so yeah, it wasn't as difficult because I had a lot of it written down. The difficult part was being overwhelmed by all of what I had and trying to consolidate it into something that other people were going to understand because it made sense to me, but it's because I had read all those books and listened to all those interviews and audiobooks and all that stuff. And so it was difficult to like, I think it started off as like a 19 step framework and I was like, shit, this is way too long. I got to get it down to like seven to 10. Um, and just kept cutting it out, cutting it out, cutting, cutting it down and making it more relatable. And so what's the name of the book? Uh, it's called How Successful People Get Ish Done. Um, so I, I wove in my name in there. Um, uh, and the subtitle is a uh, seven step framework to achieve your goals. And so you mentioned earlier how like when you when you got into self-development, I believe the first book was Smart Cuts. Oh, yeah. Great book. You, you saying earlier how like no one looked like you when you were reading these books. And so you wanted to be that person that for other people and you wrote with that audience in mind and from my understanding you use different references or something that would have more meaning with that audience than other references right 
Yeah, little things. Uh, I mean, if you're a person of color, like listening and you read the book and you compare it to a Think and Grow Rich or like, you know, Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, there's little things, there's little remarks that I'll say, the tone of voice that I write in. Um, I, at the very end of the book, I use a quote by Nipsey Hussle, which is like, there's a rapper here in LA uh, who passed away recently. And like that, would you would never find that. Tim Ferriss book or like, you know, any other self-development book. Um, I think I, I referenced like Selena and other, other things like that, you know? And so talk to me, obviously with being a self-development book, I'm curious how you developed over the time of putting it together. Oh man, that was crazy. So when I started the book, it was before the pandemic. When I finished the book, it was middle of the pandemic or like during the heat of things. Um, also Kobe Bryant was like somebody who I look up, looked up to a lot. Um, not necessarily that I was like a hardcore Lakers fan. I don't watch sports too much, but I'm like a really big fan of like high performers. And I think he was really good at performing really highly in different areas of his life. And he was like also a good, uh, like role model too. Right. It's like, you can be like a beast basketball player, also be a family man, be a great dad and do X, Y, and Z. Like the man did it all. And so also during that time of writing the book, like he also passed away, like during the horrible accident. And so it was just a weird, like roller coaster of emotions, right? Starting the book, the world is normal, quote unquote. And then halfway through, Kobe passes away, global pandemic hits, and I'm still writing the book. And everybody's at home, and I have to publish this somehow, you know? So it was, uh, it was definitely interesting. And it was so many different emotions, but well worth it. So, how did you change from before you wrote the book and after? I don't know necessarily if I changed, but. I think I have a new appreciation for authors and anybody who puts their work out there that is sealed. Meaning if you put an Instagram post out there, you can always delete it, right? You can edit the caption and you can delete it. You put a tweet out there, you can't edit the caption, but you can always delete it. With a book or other, you know, other things like books, it could be like material goods that you put your life, blood and sweat and tears into creating and other people have in their hands. It's insane because you can't edit that anymore. And uh, when I first published the book, I think I rushed the process. And actually, I know I rushed the process because there were errors. There was a bunch of errors in it. And uh, I got like feedback from a bunch of friends. And I was like, oh, shit, like, how do we not catch all this? But when you're like that deep in the, in, in the weeds, like, you've read it so many times. that It's just like rough draft copy number one and rough draft copy number 17 like it all just like blends in one like together. And so when I published it, I was like, damn, this is out there. People have it in their homes and like, it's not even the best product. So what I decided to do is I hired a second editor and then we spent like about a week and a half, just like every single day, putting in tons of hours, reading the entire thing and refining it and then republishing the whole book. Um, and even then I think some of it could have been better, but given the, the resources, I was a self-development book. I funded it myself. I published it myself, like I was on Amazon, you know, Amazon KDP, doing all of that stuff, publishing it myself. I didn't hire anybody to do that. Um, I think I did a decent job given the, the resources available. Is there ever going to be, is there going to be another book you're working on at some point? Yeah, yeah. So I started a second book and actually a third book, middle of, mid, like midway through the, the first one, just because there were certain things that I picked up on um, that were tangential but that didn't necessarily make sense to fit in because it would have been, it would have taken more than just a chapter. Um, so I started, there's two other ones. One of them is inspired by a Tim Ferriss book. Um, I'm not going to share which one because people will know exactly what I, what I'm going to write. Um, but it's kind of like on the back burner right now. So I'm not prioritizing it because I have my plate full, but probably sometime next year, uh, middle of year, I'll start it up again. Um, and it shouldn't be too much work to publish now that I've, I know the process. And so speaking of like, so you said that like you're not doing it right now because your plate's full. How do you determine what to work on? Because I feel like that's a problem for a lot of people, especially when it comes to finding their passion or anything. It's like, I don't know what to do because I want to do everything, but they don't have time for everything. So how do you determine of all the things that you want to do, you want to work on, you want to build, what are the ones that, that you work on now? Yeah, good question. Um, and it kind of goes back to the book too, honestly. So uh, start with the goal and work backwards. So right now, um, my goal is to try to retire. Uh, I'm 29, 
to try to retire in my third, like in by the time I'm 30, not like before my birthday, but like I want to be 30 years old and retire. Um, and that's like super audacious goal, not necessarily retire from work, but retire from like nine to five work and to be able to work because I want to, not because I have to. Um, that's like the dream. Everybody wants that. Right. But I being like the person who I am, I like take initiative and I work backwards and I develop this like insanely crazy, massive like plan on how I'm going to do it. And it's like a huge project plan with an infographic that I built out and I laid out step by step exactly how I'm going to do it. Um, because this has to do with money and capital and retiring. The goal was essentially like either build enough capital investments, businesses, or, um, having equity in companies that will provide me with the recurring income and security to be able to not work or work as I please. And so right now my priorities are building towards that goal and also doing things that support my mission of helping people achieve their goals. I want to help 1 million people achieve their goals by 2025. And I'm continuing to chip that chip away at that by like doing the podcast, writing the book, doing more uh, social content, building my following online so that when people see my content, they learn from it. You know, it's not just like Instagram flexes all the time. You know what I mean? And I understand. And with, with the building wealth goal specifically, is that, is the prime, one of the big focuses right now is that the NFTs? I've been seeing you tweet a lot about NFTs. Is that a, a part of it? That's a part of it. I'd probably say it's about 10% of the goal um, or the, of the execution of it. Um, so there's like NFTs. I think that that's an opportunity because we're so early. Um, I'm going to try to flip seven Ethereum, which is probably like 25 K into like half a million dollars. If I'm able to do that flip, then I plan on investing half of that into other businesses that are going to provide recurring income. For example, let's say in a hypothetical situation that I'm able to pull this off and get $500,000 free tax, obviously, and invest a hundred thousand into a condo in Mexico that is self-sufficient, self-managed and self-ran by the condo, you know, uh, staff. If I purchase that building or that, that condo, um, market it because I'm a good marketer. I think I can get people to rent it out and, you know, give me a recurring income, use another 200, 100,000 of that buy a property, maybe a two bedroom or two unit. Um, duplex somewhere here in LA or another city, live in one, rent out the other, basically have no expenses for living. Um, another one that I'm thinking of doing, it's going to be a lot of work, but um, maybe like a coffee shop, um, something that I use every single day, something that I think I can market pretty well, get people to show up. Um, and yeah, I just, I also try to align my interests too, right? So like things that I genuinely enjoy doing, if I could mix it in with business, um, then I think that that's a, it's a home run. So those are a couple of ways that I'm thinking of it too. Yeah. And I kind of want to dig a little deeper on NFTs with you because that's something I'm kind of looking at exploring right now. Like I just bought, so I haven't bought any NFTs yet. I bought my first crypto two days ago. So I bought a hundred dollars worth of Solana. After this, I'm going to buy a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin and a hundred dollars worth of ETH. And I'm going to split, I'm going to probably look at invest about a thousand dollars a month into those three primarily to start and kind of split them 33% each. Um, but so what do you, so that's kind of my strategy as when it comes to crypto, but obviously I'm going to take some of that and put it into NFTs as well. Um, so I'm curious what you look for when you're looking at NFT, because you said it's early and it is, but there is like, I feel like three new projects every single time I open Twitter and it's just very difficult to keep up. It's like, how do you stay on top of everything and know, and what do you look for when making the decision to invest in a project? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, generally speaking, I like to look for a few things. So it's like the team, is there a team that's like managing the discord or managing the social or managing everything, wrangling people together? Is there a good team? Um, the community, everybody in, in NFT says that community is king. But if you spend five minutes in one of their discords and you feel like it's a bad vibe, then get the heck out of it and don't invest in that project. And if you do it, you'll know what I mean. Like sometimes there's just like, some projects are just like pump and dumps. And like, I try not to get into those. Um, so it's like the team community traction is another one. Um, and by the way, I learned this because I work at a startup. And so this is the way we're being evaluated is like these venture capitalists are looking at us as like, what are the three things that they're looking at team 
the like team slash talent um traction and uh i mean it's like, kind of like team talent and traction out of three and so i'm doing the same thing with, with nfts um that's normally what i would do and traction can be defined as like social following was originally what i did social following in discord but a lot of projects are hacking that and buying twitter followers which is whack um so now i'm looking at engagement but like if you look at their tweets and they have ten thousand retweets look through the retweets and be like okay half of these are like bots or look at the comments how do you have ten thousand retweets and zero comments or the discord says you have thirty thousand people but yeah i go in here and it's crickets nobody's talking for an hour two hours three hours like that's impossible so I try to stay away from those projects um another thing for traction is like sales Every, it's like everything's on the blockchain we can see all of the sales so look over time are there spikes are there decreases number of sales per day is the floor price going up is it going down what does the community feel when the floor price goes down are they freaking out are they panic selling or are they calm cool and collected and say like it's okay we believe in the long term long term of this project so we're going to just keep holding those are the projects that i look for you know um that's normally the thesis that i have but i have a different hypothesis uh as of today I, I still use that, but I think because like you alluded to as well, NFTs are like coming out every single day, right? There's like three or four projects pumping every single day. So I think that there's going to be a shift happening in the next couple of weeks where the average NFT investor is going to stop trying to like ape into these, you know, random drops and uh, want to start collecting the projects that I have like sustained over time. Things like Rumble Kongs, things like Lazy Lions, things like Fast Food Punks. They've been around for like two or three months, which in NFT land is like years. So they've lasted a long time, you know? Um, they've been consistently buying or like the floor price has stayed strong and the community is still like upbeat. Like people are gonna wanna double down on those because they're less risky investments versus other ones that just launched a week ago or two days ago that pumped up to like, like one ETH overnight, but then they're gonna drop like crazy because everybody was in it for the wrong reasons. So that's kind of my investment thesis on NFTs. So you kind of so when you're looking at NFTs and you're looking more so now, not necessarily to mint when they launch, but almost a secondary market to see how it goes post launch, and then you kind of make your move after that. Yeah, yeah. There's a that's usually what I do unless the art is really really dope and I really really want it. Um, I can't think of the one. There's one that I saw on my Twitter feed. And I've been following it because the art is just super cool. I can send it to you afterwards. But that's the other thing too. Is like different NFT investors have different strategies. Some people just buy stuff that's all hype and then hope it pumps. I only buy stuff if I think the art is cool. Because if I spend $400 on the NFT and it goes to zero, I at least want to like the art. You know, I would hate to like spend $400 on a weird animal toad zombie thing and it goes to zero and then like I'm stuck with it. And I just have to look at it or hide it from my wallet, my OpenSea wallet, you know? hundred percent. I remember because like the one I was like, I'm going to look at this project. I think I was like, I was committed to making it my first NFT, but then it just exploded before mint. And that was the sevens. Like oh, I yeah. found them relatively early. Though, like, it died out. It died out very quickly. So I'm glad I didn't buy into it. Um, but now I'm like looking around trying to figure out what that first NFT purchase is. Um, Actually, but- I'm going to stop you there because funny enough you say that. Uh, I'm looking at the sevens again because they've been around for a little while. Like the floor price has like dropped significantly. Um, but if you think about it, like from a marketing perspective, they have a brand awareness out there. Everybody knows the sevens. So like in a few weeks or in a few months, when all of these 90% of other whack projects just die out, what's going to be remaining? It's going to be like pudgy penguins, lazy lions, like the secondary blue chip ones, right? But then there's like a third layer of projects that have to fill that role. So we have the CryptoPunks layer one. Layer two is like Pudgy Penguins and other things like that. Lazy Lions, Rumble Kongs. And layer three is like these sub one ETH projects that have been around for a little while. Maybe like not as pumping as hard, but they haven't died out. And there's still people talking about them and using the you know profile pictures. So I think those are the ones to look out for. And those are going to be the sleepers that nobody's going to like expect. That's a good call. I'm still, yeah, like I said, I'm still very early in this, in this whole process. It's fascinating to me. And I'm also a big thing like that I've been kind of looking at is like utility. Like what are they doing beyond just the art? Cause the art's cool, but like, I think that's obviously, you know, but like where NFTs is going to be heading is, is what 
happens beyond the art. You know, like Gary Vee's V friends, like my buddy bought like two of those and I wish I'd been in NFTs at that point in time because like I've been a Gary Vee fan for forever and I didn't buy it. Uh, but like, I think they started like 2K and now they're like 70K or something like that. Like it's just Holy insane. Crap. But that's because of the utility <laughs> built on top of yeah. it. Yeah. And his brand too. Oh, you can't, you can't doubt that his brand pays a big part in it too. He's not going to let it fail. Yeah, no, I just bought 48 copies of his book because every 12 copies, he's giving some surprise NFT in exchange for it. And so like, so I bought 48 copies. I guess that's technically my first NFT purchase. I just don't actually know what it's going to be yet. Yeah, that's Um, cool. Yeah, but one one thing you said when you're looking at projects is, is you look at the founders as well and you try to evaluate kind of the team behind it. How are you evaluating the team behind a project? Is it just going onto the the website and kind of going a deep dive on their Twitter and their socials and Googling the names? Or like, do you reach out to these people? Like, what does that look like? No, sometimes it's just like being in the Discord and waiting till something pops off. And like people start arguing or people like, um, think about this in the workplace. Like if you were, you know, with your coworkers and your coworkers started arguing and fighting and the boss handle it, very poorly and blamed both of them and like basically reprimanded them that's a bad boss you know the boss is supposed to calm people down it's supposed to you know make light make light out of the situation make everybody feel better um and inspire people to like want to work right the same thing with nfts right like some of these projects have really bad leaders they have good projects but when push comes to shove like they're managing discourse with twenty thousand people you know, so their leadership skills come very apparent very quickly um, in those situations. So sometimes I'm just a fly on the wall, like listening and watching. It's like, oh, that person just says something super racist in the Discord. Let's see how the leadership team reacts to it. Are they going to kick them out? Are they going to step aside or, you know, ask that person to jump on a quick call? Are they going to, you know, just blast them in front of 20,000 people? Um, and that's kind of how I evaluate the team. I mean, you can look them up on like Twitter and Instagram and kind of stalk them. But just like interviewing a, a job candidate, like a candidate for a job, that's not going to be super helpful. You kind of got to see them work um, in order to evaluate them. How are you keeping up with the discords? Because I feel like yeah, even just like one discord, like it goes so quickly. You know what I mean? Like how do you getting a proper kind of sense, especially if you're evaluating multiple projects and multiple projects have like tens of thousands of people in the discord each. Like how are you kind of staying on top of it and getting a good sense of it? Good question. Um, I mean, I, I also, for people listening, I, uh, I recorded, I mean, like I documented all of this in a thread on Twitter. So it's my pinned tweet. I probably have like 20 or 25 tweets and I added to it like every couple of days, things that I'm learning tools, my investment process, my thesis, all that stuff is there. But for discord specifically, it is pretty overwhelming because there's so many people in there and they're all in different time zones. Um, I will like go in and check on the different projects throughout the day. So like lunchtime. I'm waiting for my food to cook. I'll like spend five minutes in the Discord just like browsing and seeing what people are talking about. Maybe I'll hop in and say hi to everybody so that they recognize my name. Um, Twitter, uh, I send notifications for the, like a few of the key projects that I keep track of, um, the ones that I'm highly invested in because I want to see like over time, how are their sales coming up? So I have their sales bots. There's Twitter sales bots that a lot of these products have. And I get a notification for each of the sales that come in. I have notifications off my phone because it's overwhelming. But I, whenever I go into Twitter, I have a little notification within Twitter that says like, okay, you have four new notifications from fast food punks. I want to click here to see what they are. And then I'll see like, okay, well, yesterday I remember that, that one sold for three. Now it's selling for five. That's pretty crazy. Then I'll go to, then if I see something that's out of the ordinary, I'll go to the discord and see like, what is the community talking about? Um, but yeah, it's, it can be time consuming. So I try to like, set a little structure around it you know don't spend more than five minutes within the discord unless i'm doing something um try to make it so that the information comes to me on a regular basis so i don't have to go out and find it using twitter alerts and stuff like that uh, but that's pretty much how i do it and so when you make the decision to invest in in a project are you buying multiple multiple pieces because yeah, also if you're going to flip it you don't want to get rid goal. of the project right yeah so i started a, a different wallet a different for people listening who don't maybe don't know is like you can have a, a virtual wallet where you hold your nfts i started a different one that's a hodl wallet like a long-term hold wallet um and because i'm investing in the short-term flips and the long-term pers- like uh prospect in the loss in the long term um i do try to buy two or three or four or five originally it was three so i was buying three of everything 
And then the goal was to sell the first one to make up for all three of the price. So if I paid 0.33 ETH for three of them, that's one ETH. The goal is to sell one of them for at least 0.99 ETH to make, you know, zeros pretty much playing with house money. And then the second one is to make a nice little profit. And the third one is to keep as a moon bag in case like things fly, like and go to 50 ETH. I still had one at least, you know. Um, so I'm still doing that, but if the project is really early on and I have liquidity, like I have ETH available, then I'll try to buy like five or more. Like one project that I just bought a bunch was uh, Bad Bunnies, mainly because I I think the art is the best art that I've seen. Um, it's cartoony, it's fun, it's cool, it's bright. They're doing like a, a card game behind it. And I was like a huge Pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh guy growing up or kid growing up. Um, Discord is dope. It was like a stealth project. They didn't hire a bunch of influencers um, to like pump it like other projects do, which can be a red flag. And so that one, I bought like 15 of them. I bought like five and then I sold one of my other NFTs or two of my other NFTs and just like doubled down um, and then bought more. Now I think I have like nine or 10 and I've sold the other four or five for profit, making at least two uh, like double for each of them. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of my strategy. If I like wholeheartedly believe in it, then I'll buy more than three. But if I just have a really good gut, and that's another thing too, is like a lot of this stuff, because I'm learning so much on a daily basis and I'm putting myself in front of all this information, there's stuff that I'm picking up on that I don't even know. So like I have to trust my gut sometimes versus try to be over analytical on something. You know, like, oh, floor price is low. That means that, you know, bad, bad investment. And in the back of my head, my gut's telling me like, dude, these things are flying. Their brand is on point. You know, the, the creative is really good. The design is awesome. The Discord's great. This tells me that this is a good like bet because you're betting at the end of the day, right? And so how do you learn to trust your gut in that situation? Especially when you're playing, you're trusting your gut with like actual money. So like, how do you, is that like something just by doing it more and more, you get more comfortable with it? Uh, there's two parts to it. The first part is, uh, I mean, everybody says this in NFTs, but don't put in stuff that you can't lose. Don't put in money that you can't lose. So once you do that, then you're kind of like, it's like Chuck E. Cheese coins in a weird way. Like if you lose it, you're just still going to go home and have fun, right? You're going to have a good day. Um, but the cool thing about it is when you start like making money or making ETH, Ethereum, your Chuck E. Cheese coins multiply. So now you're playing with house money and you still have NFTs in the, in the vault. So I think that's when it becomes a lot easier to trust my gut because if I can say like, okay, I start off with seven Ethereum. Um, I, you know, have 25 NFTs and the current value of these is worth 40 Ethereum if I sold right now. If I, if I want to buy into this one project and it's kind of risky and this one goes to zero, well, I still have all of this house money to play on. So it's okay, you know? Or it's okay to take a loss on some of them because I know that one investment is going to make up for a hundred of them if I do it right. Yeah, it's yeah, it's very much like startups, right? Where it's like you'll have some decent returns, but you're looking for that that moonshot one potentially that could make everything worth it. And I'm curious. So you said you're learning more and more on a daily basis. What's kind of like the biggest mistake or the biggest lesson you've learned since starting doing all this? This is not investment advice, but a lot of people are super impatient in the NFT space, like insanely impatient. I thought the crypto industry was impatient because they wanted gains like returns super quickly. The NFT space is like one day impatient, hours impatient, meaning like people will buy something and if it doesn't like increase in value in the next six hours, they'll sell it at a loss. And so understanding that as you go into the space, can make you a lot of money because you can t essentially take advantage of these people because i think most of the space is in that mindset like they just want a quick flip immediate flip and so if they're willing to take a loss on a great nft because they want the liquidity to put into another project and you think that that project that they have the nft for is going to be worth more then you basically got it at a 25 percent discount so you just accumulate from those people um especially when things aren't being talked about for that project. So like attention span for NFT community is so small. Everybody's just focused on like one or two projects at a time. And then other ones are like slowly pumping or just stagnant. So I try to buy when things are stagnant. Um, like for example, Rumble Kongs is one of my favorite projects. 
and they went up to like two ETH. And then people started focusing on other things like Lazy Lion and all these other new drops like Mechaverse. Now Rumble Kongs is like sitting around one ETH. So my goal is to flip one of my NFTs like in the next week, buy up a few Rumble Kongs while things are quiet. And I'm sure that that's going to go back up because they already have like 4,000 holders and like have sold so much in Ethereum and everybody knows about it. Steph Curry has a Rumble Kong. All these people have one. So it's like, if this if this bull market continues, the likelihood of Rumble Kong continuing to going up is like very high in my opinion. If the bull market stops, then everything goes down, but it was at least a risky bet. And are you putting like, so are you basically all your money you're putting in Ethereum, you're, you're putting it into NFTs or are you just letting any of the Ethereum kind of sit? Uh, so far with this, it's kind of like a game that I've been doing. Uh, I've been double downing on all of my investments. Um, so I started off with seven. I actually added in like three more ETH. So technically of 10, the goal was to go from seven to 100. I'm actually increasing the goal to go from 10 ETH to 150 ETH, which is going to be really, really tough. Um, but the only way I'm going to be able to do it is to keep doubling down and then start taking profits pretty soon. So probably like in my next two sales, I'll take one or two ETH and just put it in the vault. Like actually move it over to Coinbase and just like let it stake or something to make interest. Um, and then, you know, keep doubling down on the current investments that I have with the current, you know, NFTs that I have. With that, with this really big goal that you have, you know, like you said earlier, it's like, it's a huge goal and it's not going to be easy. But I think the thing with a lot of people is they look at them and they're like, well, it's hard to achieve, so I shouldn't even try. But even if you don't hit that, your goal, you're going to be so much further along than had you never tried in the first place. It's like that, what is it, shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll land among the stars or whatever. There's like, that's kind of like the same thing. That's, that's how I live my life with everything that I do. Like fitness, business uh and you can you can look at like my uh my career and my linkedin profile and my instagram and see it and it's true that's how i live my life it's like i'm gonna shoot so far over the goal that everybody else didn't even think about because in their mind it's like that's not possible example number one djing in las vegas for my birthday like it was three months before my birthday and i told my best friends i was like i'm gonna dj in las vegas before july 30th this year and they're like what the fuck? like las vegas like you know how hard it is to get a las vegas pool party like you need to be a, a famous person you need to have um a booking agent i was my own booking agent i was my own promoter i was my own social media manager i did everything and like i shot above what everybody in in my community or in the dj community thought was possible and i got it but even if i didn't i would have still gone on a a US DJ tour in Miami, New York, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Like I still did a full US tour through it, you know? So book two, right? Like nobody thinks of writing a book. Nobody thinks of writing a book, especially like if you come from a community like me, like that's so far-fetched. Like a lot of people in, and it's so sad, but a lot of people in my community don't read enough books. So the thought of like writing a book is like, what the hell, you know? And then the benefits from that with having those big goals is there's focus. So you'll see more results because you're so focused on that goal. And that's something like I'm trying to implement more into my life is these sprints is picking something I want to go all in on for 30, 60, 90 days and just see how far I can take it in that time, which also lets me to experiment with different things and find what I could potentially lead me to finding what I'm passionate about without sinking too much time into something and getting five years in and being like, oh, I actually don't think I like this. That's the other important part is setting the like ambitious timeline um overly ambitious timeline for example i wrote the i wrote and published the book in eight months granted i rushed the process a little bit but everybody that i spoke to said it would take me two to three years to write the book and publish it and i said fuck that i'm gonna do it in less than a year i'm gonna do it in 10 months um and i did it you know so i think that we put a lot of fluff in our life in our lives um to as like a just in case like just in case i don't hit it i'm going to give myself an extra two months just in case i don't hit this i'm going to be able to like fall back on this it's like if you actually just set like a more focused timeline a more ambitious timeline like you'll be able to accomplish so much more because you'll spend less time on social media less time on you crap that just it, it consumes your life and i'm curious too like with with putting these goals out now i know you're very big on learning in public where does the comfort level with sharing these goals come from? Because with sharing these big audacious goals, 
you're not going to accomplish every single one, hundred percent. It's like, where's the comfort level with putting out there a goal that, you know, there's a very real chance you aren't going to accomplish. So that's actually, I think the sixth step or seventh step in the book is, uh, finding others in your community that hold you accountable for things that you say you're going to do. And in the book, I talk about the power of mentors, the power of coaches, the power of, uh, you know, the 10 closest people around you, your friends, your family, even. Um, but then we're putting that on its head and saying, okay, these are the people around me that I'm going to learn from that are going to essentially shape me as a person, shape my mood, shape how I feel, shape what I'm learning, shape what I'm saying, shaping my life on a daily basis. Then why not flip it and say like, I want you guys to hold me accountable for doing X, Y, and Z. And so I essentially use social media to do that at scale because I don't have time to like text my friend that I'm doing this or that. I just like, all right, this is what I, this is going to be my goal. I've thought about this long and hard. I know this is what I want. I'm going to put it out there into the world because somebody out there is going to be watching and is going to say like, damn, that shit is crazy. And even if they don't reach out or tell me anything, me knowing that there's somebody watching is going to make me work hard. And that's just intrinsically how I am and how I operate. And when you set these goals, like obviously with ETH one, that's like an outcome driven goal, but do you ever focus on process driven goals? Like for example, like my goal for October was three TikToks a day, every single day, starting on Monday. I started Monday. So the fourth, not the first, but I started on the fourth. There was three TikToks a day, every day for the rest of the month. That was like the goal. There wasn't like a hundred K or 10 K or anything. So do you try to focus on outcome or, or, uh, or, yeah, um, I've done that process. when I did my blog, it was one blog a week for 52 weeks, I think. And I got like 48 or 50 of them out there in a year. Um, other ones include like learning, learning goals. So I think it was like 2018. I can't remember what year it was. I think my goal was to read 50 books or listen to 50 books. And so I broke it out and it was like three books or three or four books a month or something like that. And so I was like, okay, that means I got to read one or two books a week. And so then I would break it out like that. Like, okay, if I got to read one or two a week, then that means like during my Stairmaster session at the gym, I need to use those six hours a week in order to listen to a book, which equals half of a book. Where am I going to find the other six hours to listen to the other half of the book? Okay, I will walk right in the bus to the, to the gym, to work. I can squeeze in 15 minutes there. 15 minutes times five equals X amount of time. So that's kind of the way I do construct the goals. And then um built them around my schedule my rituals and my routines so that they just like flow it a lot better and if anyone i like 50 books in a year is a lot for some people so if they kind of want to fast track through those 50 books they can just read one and that's read how successful people get it done <laughs> it's you distilling everything that you learned into that book but i know we're at a time here so i just want to jump to my last couple questions first one being is just how often do you reflect on the whole journey uh not as much as i should but I do set two times a year to reflect. So once is on January 1st. I think everybody does that. Um, and then the second is my birthday is July 30th. So on my birthday every single year, I reflect on not only like the entire journey in my life, you know, turning another year older, but also like all of my goals. Like I take a hard look at them and say like, okay, I set these six, seven months ago. Which of these do I still want to continue? Which of these are a waste of time? And which of these do I need to like double down on? Um, so that's kind of like my moment of pause, but I, I should do it more often. I just, I, uh, I like to execute and just keep going. Um, cause I found like that's just the way that I'm able to get things done, uh, most efficiently. For my last question, I like to flip the script a little bit. So instead of me asking the question, it's you asking the question, but it's not to me. Pretend you have a crystal ball. You can ask this crystal ball, any question, you'll get the 100% honest answer. What is one question you want to know the answer to? Yeah, how do I how do I teach people how to find what they genuinely love to do faster and more efficiently? I think that there's processes for that, but I don't think that there's a quicker way. And I think the best way that I found and from listening to other people and even super successful people who have kids is um exposing them to a lot of different things and then over time, sh like shifting them into certain directions based on what they like and what they're attracted to and gravitated to. I think that takes a lot of time though, because you need to put in the time if you want to like play baseball and then like, oh, I don't want to play baseball anymore. Okay, you quit after three months, so I want to play soccer. Oh no, actually I want to start a podcast. I didn't really like that that much. I'm going to do this. Now you just wasted years of your life or you spent years of your life, you didn't really waste them. 
But I think to be able to fast track that um, in a matter of like weeks or months would save a lot of people a lot of time and would give them a lot of time to invest into that craft or that business or whatever it is that they want to do. But I think a lot of times people don't know what they want to do and they're kind of like just lost, you know? Um, so being able to help them with that question, like, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up and I'm going to, I'm already a grown up, you know, that happens a lot. Um, but I think the, the answer is like, you know, exposing yourself to a lot of things, trying a lot of things, seeing what you like and then shifting it over time towards that direction. Uh, I like that. That's a good, that's a good question. You know, I never know what to expect when I ask that. So I really like that question. Um, but I, I appreciate your time and I want to give the floor. Where can the people find you plug anything and everything you got right now? Yeah, uh, I'll keep it super simple. So it's uh, Ish Verduzco, I-S-H-V-E-R-D-U-Z-C-O. Probably Twitter, if you want to learn like how I think, what I'm learning and what I'm doing, it's Twitter. Um, Instagram, I use it more of like a share daily updates on what I'm doing. So when I wake up at five o'clock in the morning, there's a picture of that. When I go to sleep at 9.30 at night, there's a picture of that, you know? So I just kind of like document my day. Um, Depends on what you want to like learn of me or what I'm learning. You can go to either one. And then from there, you go down a rabbit hole of like a lot of other stuff. So yeah, it was great chatting with you, man. I appreciate it. Hopefully the listeners learned something. Um, and yeah, if you have any, any questions or anything else you want to learn about me, check out my Twitter. I'm sure you'll find a lot of good stuff there. Awesome. Like I said, man, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time for coming on this podcast and the listeners definitely learned something listening to this podcast. I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below those so that can make it easy to find you and everything you got going on, especially the book. If I wants to pick up a copy of the book, that'll be linked in the show notes down below as well. Uh, but I want to thank you once again for taking time to come on the show. And I want to thank everybody for listening, whether you've listened the entire way through or you only listen to bits and pieces. I really appreciate you taking time to check this out. Everyone do me a big favor, go and follow Ish, go pick up a copy of his book. Like I said, everything's linked in the show notes down below so you can find it. You can find me everywhere on social media at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.